This is part one of a presentation by Jim Shawless for the 2020 Virtual Fuel Conference. Hello, my name is Jim Shawless and I work for the Bureau of Geologic Survey and I'd like to uh, discuss with you the mapping project that we undertook for the Ohio Powell State Park and the Greater Yakagani River Gorge area. And this area is located in the southwestern portion of the state. And you have uh, two major mountain ridges running through it. You have Laurel Ridge running in the southeastern portion of the mapping area and Chestnut Ridge in the northwestern portion. Okay, and this area is uh, characterized by uh, at least four synclines and two major anticlines. You got the lower Yakagani syncline in the extreme southeastern corner, and you've got Lower Hill Anticline, Ligonier Syncline, Chestnut Ridge Anticline, which is offset by the Elliottsville syncline right here, and then Chestnut Ridge picks up again over here. And then in the extreme northwestern corner, you've got the Union Town Syncline. So Laurel Ridge and Chestnut Ridge are both asymmetrical, uh, large, open amplitude folds. And uh, they're both in the uh, Allegheny Mountain section of the uh, Appalachian Plateau Province. So physiographically, this whole area is made up mainly of this Allegheny Mountain section, except for the extreme northwestern corner here, which is the Pittsburgh Low Plateau, west of Chestnut Ridge. And that's more or less characterized by lower uh, amplitude open folds. And here's a cross section that runs through the area. And, and you can see uh, right here the, the dips uh, about six to eight degrees on the eastern flank of Lower Hill, but then over in this area, right, well, there's an area here that was a fault zone, and uh, it's very steep there to almost vertical. Uh, when you get away from that, the dips start to uh, return to normal again, but Chestnut Ridge is the same situation where uh, more gradual dips on the eastern side, and you're on the western side, it can get... Uh, somewhat steep again, at least over 10 degrees easily. This area is about equal to a 15 minute quadrangle, but actually in total area, it's about equal to five, seven and a half minute quadrangles. Uh, four main ones are included are South Connellsville, Mill Run, Fort Necessity, and Ohio Pile seven and a half. Uh, there's lots of public lands included in this area. You've got the uh, Ohio Powell State Park. It runs through the center. It's about 20,000 acres. You've got the uh, Bear Run Nature Preserve just next to it, maintained by the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy. It's got falling water in it, mansion. Uh, you've got uh, a little bit of Laurel Ridge State Park up here in the northeast, and you've got some state game lands on either uh, side of Ohio Powell State Park and on to the east and uh, also here over to the west. And you've got uh, uh, some Forbes State Forest lands down here in the uh, southwestern corner. You've got uh, some federal lands. You've got Fort Necessity Battlefield down here and also the uh, Yakagani River Lake Dam, which is a flood control dam maintained by the Army Corps of, Army Corps of Engineers. And uh, you've got some uh, rail trails that run through the area. And this one, the Great Allegheny Passage, runs from Confluence, 28 miles, up through uh, the uh, along the Yakagini River, all the way up to uh, Connellsville up here. And you also have this uh, Indian Creek Valley Trail. That's another rail trail that's connected over here uh, along the river. And you've got a sheepskin rail trail that runs to the south here. So there's a lot of public lands included in this area. 
Yeah, the first uh, serious attempt at mapping uh, the area was done by J.J. Uh, Stevenson in 1876 with his geologic map of Fayette County. Uh, he had the Devonian uh, designated as the Catskill uh, 10. The Pocono was the Mississippian along with the Machunk. And then he had his Pennsylvanian divided up into four parts. He had this upper Freeport with uh, lower conglomerate 12, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and lower barren measures, Pittsburgh bed, the upper measures, and an upper barren ma uh, measure. So about uh, 25 years after Stevenson's work, uh, the area is remapped again by uh, Maurice Campbell, the USGS. Uh, he covered a little bit of the area uh, northwestern corner of this uh, project area and also the western half with two folios uh, Brownsville Connellsville and Masontown Uniontown folio and he didn't have a whole lot of uh, Devonian or uh, even upper uh, middle lower Mississippian to look at so he didn't really make any changes there but he did make some changes in the, uh, the Pennsylvanian uh, that Stevenson had mapped and uh, main, the main area where he changed things up uh, was he had, uh, Stevenson had an upper Freeport and lower coal measures, uh, conglomerate 12, and Campbell divided that up into uh, an Allegheny formation and a Pottsville formation. And also then he changed the uh, lower, his lower Barron to the Conema formation, his Pittsburgh bed and upper coal measures to the Monongahela formation and the upper barren measures to the, the Dunkard formation. And he also made a major contribution by recognizing a, a, a new formation, the Carmichael's, which was uh, he uh, described as uh, abandoned uh, river channels uh, that formed terraces along the major drainages uh, in the county. And uh, you'll be hearing a lot more of that uh, about that from Frank Lozagli here in the other sessions. Now, as far as Stevenson's work goes, uh, right above Ohio Powell Falls here, uh, he's showing he's showing Ma Chunk Formation. And that's an area Campbell didn't really cover, so, so he didn't get to really look at it much. But I uh, was noticing that, and I said, boy, if that's right, our map must really be wrong in this area. So I went out and looked at it, spent a lot of time up and down the gorge there, uh, you know, and didn't couldn't find any evidence of any mud chunk being like within a half a mile above the uh, high pile falls. So I was thinking, well, what's going on here? But I uh, started looking at Stevenson's work a little closer, and I noticed that he had mentioned he had some carbonation zones and some coal, a little thin coals in his my chunk and I thought man man the light bulbs went on then I said okay so he's including into his my chunk formation some of the Pottsville rocks that we have so it's like all right and I think what I figured out is uh, that he started uh, he included everything from like the uh, Mercer coal horizon so he had some good coals there at the upper Mercer and he lumped that up into his Allegheny included that into his Allegheny formation and everything below the Mercers like the Connecticut on down he included that into his uh, Ma Chunk rocks so about 40 years later Hickok and Moyer mapped the county again and uh, I think the reason Andrew took that uh, mapping project here was that uh, this whole western part, western half of the county, was being uh, mined uh, for the Pittsburgh coal seam. But the uh, so they did a, like a really excellent structure contour uh, map all across this area. It's really great. But the uh, eastern half of the county, not much was going on there. Uh, you had uh, some country bank mines and some small uh, deep mines up in the Ligonier syncline up here in the north, but there wasn't much drill data for them to work with, and they had very limited uh, exposures to work with. And I, I remember seeing the 
uh, Allegheny Formation, I think they had like only 150 feet thick in places. And so you know that they were really uh, struggling with the uh, correlations. And, but they did the best they could. And they didn't do a, a bad job. And a lot of places, it's very accurate. And so they covered the whole area except for the extreme uh, eastern part. And this area was covered by Norm Flint in uh, 1965. And one of the things that he uh, contributed was uh, that he, he was able to see a difference difference in the uh, parts of the Kanama group. So he subdivided the uh, upper part into the Castleman Formation and the lower part into the uh, Glenshaw Formation. And the Glenshaw was characterized by these uh, persistent marine marine zones that uh, were easily identifiable, whereas the Castleman uh, did not really contain those. So he felt that was an uh, important enough distinction to uh, make this uh, separation. In 1985, we did a coal resources report for Fayette County, where we looked at the coal crop lines, mined out areas, and structured contours for all the major coal seams. And then that sort of served the basis for another county report uh, that we did on the groundwater. And this time we looked at, in addition to the coals, we looked at all the rocks and remapped those and basically conformed it to, uh, as far as nomenclature goes, to the uh, what state geologic map was using at that time. Now you might say, well, gee, it looks like this place, this area has been mapped uh, several times over and over again. What in the world are you doing remapping it? And you'd be correct in asking that question. Uh, sort of have to go back and look at the history of this. John Enters was interested in uh, at looking at rocks along rail trails. So we got us some bicycles and and we found that there was this really neat rail trail that was running through the Yakagani River Gorge. So we thought we'd, you know, maybe uh, think about that for a place to do a geologic guide. So we knew the area would be good for geologic education because of all the uh, excellent outcrops in the area. But um, we get in there to looking at them and uh, realize that our the mapping that we produced in 1988 really uh, wasn't agreeing with what we were seeing on the ground. And the reason for that was back during that time, uh, there was really no access to mount anything uh, in, those gorge, in the gorge area. And also, uh, it was mainly non-Pennsylvanian rock, so we didn't spend a lot of time uh, worrying about it. And if we were really serious about putting together a... Uh, a geologic guide for this area to be used for geologic education, we definitely should have a better map. And the reason that our maps weren't too accurate also in that area is that we did a lot of the interpretation from aerial photos and we had misidentified key beds and uh, never really landed the plane to uh, see what was going on on the ground and that was the result. So in addition to our maps not being correct, we also were facing uh, a problem is that we had a large area that we really had not uh, subdivided and it was lumped in to uh, the Shenango Osawayo and it covered a large area along the uh, rail trail. And we thought, well, it'd be nice to uh, do some subdivision along this so that we could talk about it better. And also this interval contained the Mississippi and Devonian boundary, so we thought it'd be nice to know exactly where that was. And the other reason that uh, we had for producing a geologic map in this area was that we got a request from uh, High Apollo State Park that uh, they would like, they wanted to emphasize geologic interpretation uh, in a some displays at their visitor center and also produce some 
geologic uh, guides for the park if possible. So that all played into our decision making process. So with that in mind, we uh, realized that if we really wanted to understand these rocks, we needed to get some better information. So we contracted to have two uh, long core holes done and placed them in strategic locations in the park. And so that they overlapped all but 300 feet of the 2,500 foot of exposed stratigraphic section in the gorge. So we got really good recovery. Uh, I don't think we lost hardly anything. And uh, we then had uh, the in both holes logged uh, by a really good uh, geophysical logging company and they also did video logs for us which really helped out a lot. And also want to have to thank the park managers and, and the staff too but they all uh, were really super cooperative and uh, let us basically set the drill rigs up where we needed to without any issue and, and gave us 100% uh, cooperation and were very interested and supportive of what we were doing so that was Definitely, uh, without their help, there's no way we could have done this. Uh, the mapping itself, the underground mapping, uh, was done with just a basic field gear. Probably the most important piece of field equipment I had was this uh, walking stick. And that's actually acted like a, a third leg or third arm when you're out on those steep slopes. It really uh, saved me from, uh, you know, losing my balance a lot and uh, just being able to go up and down and navigate uh, the terrain. We had some uh, challenges to the mapping, of course, uh, and uh, main ones were the steep slopes, uh, vegetation, and the tails and colluvium that were covering over the slopes obscuring you know most of the outcrops and then a uh, a fault zone that uh, created difficulty in uh, just being able to trace the beds and when we first started out we had uh, several interns that help us out and uh, they were really uh, helpful in carrying things up and down these steep slopes but uh, without some issues, uh, we had one that slid for a long ways, uh, 100 feet or so, and then just got stopped within like 10 feet uh, from going over like a 30 foot drop, which I don't think would have been too good for him. And you're also good for going uh, out ahead of you uh, in case there's anything that uh, you might not want to step on. And here's a uh, structure contour map that we developed on the top of the Homewood sandstone. And uh, the reason we chose the top of the Homewood is it's uh, the most easy, uh, probably part of the whole geologic column out there to interpret to the general public. Uh, the uh, Homewood sandstone member is uh, sort of ubiquitous uh, all across the landscape out there. Uh, it forms many of the uh, scenic overlook ledges. It's uh, under waterfalls and uh, there's large blocks uh, laying all over the surface of the landscape and it's in the river. Uh, so it's something that people can recognize and relate to. And since this map was going to be intended for use by the general public, uh, thought it was a good idea to use the homewood and we interpreted it up to the top of the homewood uh, using uh, uh, lots of uh, key beds and uh, other datums uh, that were below it so uh, I think it I think it's okay even though it's not present everywhere we had enough information that we were able I think to represent it fairly accurately on the map and uh, we also had faulting 
and steep dips in some areas there. So we had a fault zone that ended up, as we plotted it up, uh, was right on the eastern edge of the Rome trough. And uh, it terminated with uh, two uh, cross strike features that ended up being in streams and also well, the uh, fault zone itself was on three different streams for an eight mile stretch in a straight line and uh, so you know that's uh, what you sort of would expect because if you had an area that's faulted and highly fractured uh, that would be an easy easy place to erode so your streams would end up there a lot of the mapping was done uh, on the computer back in the office, but you still had to really go out in the field and gather data and then try to figure it out, and the LiDAR helped tremendously with that. Before we go any further, I have to thank and acknowledge uh, John Harper for providing us with uh, the key correlation uh, sort of that we needed, sort of the Rosetta cross section uh, that he brought from, uh, put together down, coming down from Pittsburgh area down to Hyopal State Park. And uh, put together this section, I just asked him, I said, John, could you do this for us? And I didn't even tell him where our hole was located, I just said it was in the park. And as luck would have it, uh, cross section stopped within like a few thousand feet from where our hole was, so it was very easy then for us to correlate what he had uh, with what we had so and we were able to then subdivide the uh, interval from the Shenango to through the Oswego and also help to support our correlations for the other intervals so you can see our final uh, correlation uh, and this is what was from uh, the guidebook for Johnstown area in 89 Conomo Gap uh, where John put together a history of uh, correlation for uh, that part of the section and you can see how ours correlation fits in uh, right in here okay now this is what the final uh, stratigraphic column uh, looks like that we were able to put together for the park. Okay, we're going to be starting at the base of the section with the uh, oldest uh, unit in the gorge and in southwestern Pennsylvania. And uh, this unit down here we call now the Maple Summit it used to be called the Four Knobs Formation. In 1987, John Harper did a study using gas walls across uh, western Pennsylvania down into this area and found that the sandstone that uh, was being called the four knobs really was not uh, the same as what they were calling the four knobs to the uh, east of Laurel Hill. So uh, he feels that it's more strongly connected uh, at, with the base of the, the Venango formation. And uh, the four knobs that's west of Laurel Hill is separated here by a, about a 400, 450 foot thick unit of Chattacoin, which is uh, purplish red and it's quite a bit different looking than what the uh, sandstone is in the gorge and because of that and it's also uh, not conglomeratic like the one is in the gorge um, he felt that it would be proper to uh, rename it. So we're going to use uh, Laird's uh, label of Maple Summit Sandstone uh, instead of the to replace the four knobs uh, to be more accurate to show that it's uh, really not really uh, related to the four, 
four knobs and well it's not related to the four knobs to the east of Laurel Hill. At Laurel Hill there was a major basis change going on with uh, a lot of the units there because of the uh, probably the activity of uh, the, uh, the growth faults in the eastern edge of the Rome trough. Before I go much further, I should mention also that uh, I mentioned Laird, and uh, well, he, he did a uh, PhD thesis back in the 40s on the stratigraphy of the Upper Devonian, Lower Mississippi, and the Southwestern Pennsylvania. And the Okagani River Gorge was one of the uh, areas that he focused on and uh, was one of his reference sections. In the area at the time, uh, the whole geologic uh, column down there was pretty much undivided uh, in the Mississippi and Devonian. So he sort of came up with his own formations and designations for rock units and uh, collected fossils from each of those and tried to uh, assign them uh, to different uh, time uh, periods. For the Maple Summit member, according to his thesis, he found a, uh, a group of plesopods and a few uh, species of uh, spear for there. Uh, but and, and as a general comment, I just want to say that uh, there's a number of these uh, formations that he set up because it was uh, pretty much undivided. So he set up his own formations, like I said before. And uh, it was uh, difficult for me to really pin down exactly where some of these were. And he found a ton of fossils in a lot of these places. And so it really really need to have like a uh, paleontologist or somebody go in there to really uh, try to better locate some of these things because I know I, I looked through these rocks and I did not see anywhere near the number of fossils that he is describing and it could be I was just looking in the wrong spot but uh, it's unfortunate so the best I could do for a lot of this stuff was just use it as a, uh, a general reference but uh, I think there's a lot of information out there that uh, could still be obtained if uh, you had a little bit better idea of the locations. And the outcrop of the Maple Summit is located directly on the axis of the Laurel Hill Anticline where it crosses the Yakagani River Gorge. Maple Summit, uh, it's, it's a fine and medium grain sandstone. I saw a few coarse grain lenses with some flat, little small flat pebbles in them, uh, some shale pebble class, uh, interbedded siltstone and shale with some marine to brackish marine fossils, uh, a couple brachiopods, crinoids, and uh, uh, definitely some trace fossils. And it's about 150 feet thick. And this out crop has a, a number of uh, interesting things to look at. Uh, you've got uh, different kinds of sedimentary structures and uh, different kinds of sequences to examine. So it ends up being a really uh, excellent uh, teaching outcrop. And uh, John Harper and Chris Lockery put together a really nice field guide uh, for this outcrop and there's really a lot of neat things to see down there. Uh, so if you want to look at the uh, oldest rocks in southwestern Pennsylvania, I'd get a hold of this field guide and take a trip down there. Now next we go up to the Catskill Formation, and uh, there's a little more exposure uh, here. Uh, it's present on both sides of the gorge, and also in outcrop in uh, both anticlines. However, it's barely exposed in the uh, Chestnut Ridge anticline. There's only maybe the upper 50-75 feet, whereas in uh, Laurel Hill anticline you've got the whole uh, almost 500 feet of exposure there. And so you can, you can see, uh, especially over in the Laurel Hill Anticline, you've got a much larger outcrop belt 
and just a really small one here in uh, Chestnut Ridge. And the Catskill Formation uh, lithologically is made up of uh, fine grain, micaceous sandstones. You've got siltstones, claystones um, that are red, gray, grayish brown, greenish gray uh, that are interbedded a lot of times and they're, they're in fine uh, upward sequences often. Uh, and you also see uh, like brackish marine uh, and uh, alternating brackish marine and freshwater deposits in there. So I think depositionally uh, goes from alluvial plain to marginal marine. So you have this intertonguing from sediments from the west with uh, the marine sediments from the west with the terrestrial sediments coming in from the east. And uh, formation ranges in thickness from about 450 to 520. Uh, and uh, in the Laurel Hill anticlinal area of the Allegheny River Gorge, it's about 485. Um, and, and generally, uh, the overall uh, comment on this would be it seems to be a little more uh, sandier near the top. So it seems like the, the top of the Catskill Formation ends up being a sandstone in most places. Now, key beds. Uh, there is no key beds. Uh, it's the Catskill. Uh, I thought there was going to be key beds when I first started looking at it because I really wasn't sure what formation I was looking at. Um, so I spent a lot of time looking at it. There is calcareous, probably a waste of time, but there is a lot of uh, calcareous lag deposits uh, at the base of the sandstones and you get fish bones in there. Uh, but as far as key beds go, you've got, it's defined as being the top reddish bed and the lowest reddish bed defines the <clears throat> formational uh, boundaries. Uh, <clears throat> Victoria Bend is where it's best exposed on the southern side of uh, the Okagani River and here you've got a, a, a real steep cut bank and you can see cut into the bank these little notches here and those all represent each one of those uh, debris avalanche shoots. And here they are. I counted them up. There's, uh, I think, 12. There may be 13, but there's 12 good ones. Uh, and they all, except for these three down here, they all terminate in the same part of the formation, which is the very, very top. So here's some of the, uh, what they look like. And they're just like half, you know, like funneled out, uh, carved out, uh, uh, half cylinders that sort of go up the, the side of the slope. And you've got some that are really sandy at the bottom, and then you've got some that are not so sandy and have more fine grain material at the bottom, but they all have one thing in common. They all go straight up for about 400 feet. And there's everything that falls into them. There's big trees and things like that that get caught up into them. You can, if you get your, uh, beat your way through the base of it, you can walk up normally to these things at least I'd say halfway up to most of them. And uh, if you get caught up there into a, like a rainstorm or after it's rained, uh, you have to be really careful because uh, the rocks just come uh, bounding, bouncing, cascading down through the woods. Uh, they bounce. I had them bounce over my head. I could hear them crashing, coming down the slope. Uh, and the only thing you can do is get behind a big tree if you can hold on and just sort of wait it out. But I saw evidence where uh, these rocks were coming down. This is not too far from the base of the slope and they were hitting as high up as 15 feet in the air, taking the bark off the trees. So you can get about halfway up and then it gets so steep you can't go any further. And when you reach the top, 
and I didn't reach the top from climbing up from the bottom but if you reach the top they're all the same up there in, in almost all the formations they all end up in the uh, an upper sandstone and then right below the sandstone is a very soft uh, fine clay fine grained uh, units either silt or clay that's uh, been eroded away and hollowed out into a big bowl or like funnel shaped at the top and uh, the only way you can really examine the top is uh, through uh, you know you have to use ropes which we did and uh, the park manager there John House was a, an avid rock climber so he had all the gear and I went out and bought some gear and so we he ended up uh, examining uh, maybe three or four of these uh, in the top section of them until I figured out more or less that uh, they were all the same. <laughs> and while we were examining them, uh, we had to get somebody down on the trail to watch because we're knocking rocks down and uh, they're bounding down and uh, very dangerous for anybody bicycling. Thank goodness uh, nobody was injured. The base of the Catskill, and this is only exposed on the north side of the uh, gorge, has what I think is equivalent to the Irish Valley where you have a lot of clams and uh, different kinds of invertebrate fossils over there uh, that uh, when Laird studied this, he had a list of about 15 that he, he found there. I found just a, several. And when looking at the core, uh, you see all kinds of interesting things in it, of course. But uh, uh, the one thing I noticed was a lot of well-preserved plant fossils uh, and also uh, lingula. And so sometimes you'd get them in the red, they'd be in red beds, sometimes they'd be in, in gray beds. Usually the plants are in the gray and the, the marine, brackish marine fossils, uh, mainly just lingula, maybe orbiculoida, I can't remember, but they'd be in the reds. And in the outcrop you'd see uh, like, like lag deposits with fish scales and uh, plant fossils in. But in the core, we saw some really well preserved, uh, it looks like head shields from, I don't know, maybe Bothriolepis, it's hard to say. Burrowing was present uh, in the fine grained sandstones. All right, let's take a look at the Oswego formation. It's located. Uh, in the base of the Shenango through Oswego undifferentiated formation, which is one of our objectives was to try to subdivide that. And like the Catskill, uh, it's better exposed in Laurel Hill than, uh, than it is in Chestnut Ridge. The outcrop belt is much more extensive. Now, the Swale Formation is about 200 feet thick in this area, and uh, it's lithologically made up of mainly siltstone shale, with very fine grain uh, sandstone interbeds. You can see that in this outcrop on Chestnut Ridge. We're right near the axis of the Chestnut Ridge anticline here. You can see how flat lying the beds are, but all these uh, sandstones are. Uh, interbedded uh, within a very fine grain uh, deposits. So you got a lot of claystones and siltstones uh, dominating the formation. These have uh, thin limestones in them and uh, some of these are coquina beds. Uh, and one characteristic is that they are uh, uh, very burrowed uh, throughout the uh, entire interval. And uh, also, there's no quartz pebble conglomerates anywhere within this formation. And the key beds for the formation are you've got these uh, thin marine limestone beds at the very top and at the very base 
of the formation not so much in the middle but at the top and the base and like I mentioned before there's no uh, quartz pebble conglomerates and again uh, most of the core uh, most section well the middle part of the Oswego is highly burrowed I mean you can't hardly find any part of it that's not and this is uh, some of the burrowing found in floats and mud cracking and burrowing and again here's the, the limestone that's located uh, near the top of the formation right under the, the Murraysville sandstone there's a big clay shell that this is a part of uh, it's just a bed in a clay shell unit about 30 feet thick and what was interesting about this on the north side of the gorge there's a, a place called Cave Hollow and I always thought for a long long time that Cave Hollow must have referred to a cave in the Loyal Hannah because I didn't, couldn't imagine any other unit that would have a, that a, a hollow would be named after it had such an extensive cave well it turns out got to talking to some people down there after many uh, conversations and trying to track this down I located a guy who actually two people that knew about it and uh, took me down to where where it was and uh, it's a terrible place to go and try to get into so I didn't even try to get in now maybe a caver uh, might want to go in there but uh, you got to drop down about 10 12 feet and then it goes out laterally uh, I was told that uh, it's pretty extensive but uh, and some people have gotten lost there had to be rescued so it's like uh. anyway a cave in Oswego I thought was unique enough to show show it to you so uh, that's what this hollow was named after apparently it's the calcareous units who weathered out along some uh, joint planes uh, in the upper, upper part of the formation so next up is the uh, Murraysville sandstone and here we are moving up one formation further in uh, through the uh, Shenango through Oswego undifferentiated to the Murraysville uh, you can see here uh, the Murraysville is equivalent to what uh, John Harper has as a Berea and Cusawago equivalent. And I remember uh, in the Connemaw Gorge, the Berea was very burrowed. Uh, and uh, that's what we're seeing here, too, in uh, this area. And it's also outcropping in the axis of both the anticlines more extensive of course in Laurel Hill and in Chestnut Ridge uh, Murraysville sandstone is about 100 feet thick in this area it's hard to get an exact thickness on it uh, we had a really good idea in the core what it was but in outcrop it's a little tough um, a lot of the overlying beds were shaly and they were obscuring the top of it so it was a little difficult but the base uh, is medium to coarse grained a lot of times cross bedded sandstone you see in the photo right here and uh, also can be very fossiliferous uh, and as you go up through the section you get uh, finer it seems to get finer grained and you get a lot of more more interbedded units uh, so siltstones silt clay, clay shells and sandstones are interbedded sandstones are pretty fine grained and uh, mo almost everything up there is burrowed a little bit and sometimes a lot and we get uh, at least one or two calcareous sandstones that uh, occur in the top of the unit as well that seems they seem to be pretty persistent key beds for mapping uh, you've got this basal polymictite with coarse pebble conglomerates uh, and uh, possible igneous pebbles but uh, unfortunately it can never find any 
real good ones uh, represented inside the gorge itself. I had to go out adjacent to it on Route 40 to find those, and I'll show you those in a second. Uh, there was calcareous sandstones. Those seem to be pretty persistent uh, through both uh, ridges. Sclothus buds, the same way. They were persistent. And uh, no limestone coquina beds anywhere. But if you go around up on uh, Route 40, uh, there's a uh, scenic pullover, and they've got this wire mesh that's uh, preventing you from getting near the rock, covering it there. Uh, you can find what appears to me to be igneous fragments. Uh, very hard to sample to get at, but they sure do look like they could be. So, and, and it was reported to be igneous fragments. Uh, by uh, Stevenson in the second survey. He found them and had them looked at. Uh, this is the sandstone we have in the Chestnut Ridge Gorge area. And it's got a conglomerate, a poly, like a polymictite at the base. And I thought I saw some what could be igneous fragments there, but it's highly weathered and it's very hard to, very hard to get anything out of it that I could really say, yeah, that's igneous. We do have Krasina present there, uh, above that, and uh, we also have um, sandstones in this interval with uh, crinoids and marine fossils at the base. It's sort of at the base of the formation. Uh, these seem, uh, sort of sphere first seems to be present uh, in that area as well the formation about the lower 50 feet and then and you get up in the middle in the upper part you start getting into uh, these um, calcareous sandstones they're just full of fish fossils and fish bones and they're cross bedded and they're calcareous and you also get uh, interbedded thin sandstones uh, that are highly burrowed with scolithus burrows in them planites Lots of intertidal stuff. Looking at the core, you can see that it's uh, very burrowed, and uh, there's uh, the scolithus beds and outcrop. And if you go look at the core, you can see the uh, scolithus beds and these running up and down the core here, and a whole bunch of places. Uh, it's really There's really a lot of them. <laughs> and then you get these, uh, like, planoides. Uh, you got all kinds of other horizontal burrows of whatever type they are. That's pretty common. And the, especially in the roof, the overhangs of the, of the uh, bedrock layers, you see them. And large and small diameter. And here we have a nice exposure of the uh, Murraysville on the uh, north side of the gorge and Laurel Hill Anticline along the CSX tracks. And here you can see uh, here's the calcareous sandstone beds and the scolithus beds are in here and these are all just burrowed all extensively. And there's some really well defined uh, jointing here and uh, there's like a siltstone bed there. That's pretty pretty neat.